Hi everyone, it's Mo Bendari from Ortho Evidence, uh, editor in chief, ch uh, chatting today on Orthopod with Dr. Lori Heemstra, who is an associate professor at the University of Calgary. Um, she heads the Canadian Orthopedic Association's uh, gender diversity program. She also is involved uh, and was, I guess, one of the founding members of the International Orthopedic Diversity Alliance. Currently chairs the, uh, the ISACOS Gender Diversity Task Force and is to boot the second president-elect of the Canadian Orthopedic Association. With all those titles, I'm really excited to <laughs> chat with you, Laurie. But I know at the end of the day, we're just going to give this, yeah. you know, <laughs> give this your, you give this your humble approach. And I know it's a humbling, um, well, it's a humbling work you're doing overall. Um, and it's sometimes when you get into something this big, you realize we have much more to learn um, and to educate ourselves on as we're, as we're trying to contribute to the, um, to the cause. Well, let me start. How far have we come with respect to gender diversity and what are the initiatives that um, you have been uh, working on that might help us get there? Yeah, thanks, Mo. I think, you know, around the world, gender diversity has come a huge way in the last few years. And I think big kudos to the COA who kind of uh, tagged me and asked me to head this about three years ago when I came on the executive. I think among medicine, the whole gender diversity issue was still really just getting its feet wet. So they asked me to look at this about three years ago. And honestly, I kind of rolled my eyes. And like, what's going on? Like, I've done okay in orthopedics. I don't see what the big problem is, you know, just work really hard. And, but I took the task to heart and I started looking more and more into it. And honestly, I can never say that my eyes haven't been so opened as when I started looking into this into detail. And uh, there's just layer upon layer of, of social cultural issues uh, around diversity and gender diversity, which of course extends to racial diversity and all the other ones also. Um, so that, it was a real eye-opening thing for me, and I guess that's how I ended up on so many committees about it. Um, but it's been it's been really interesting, and I think the, the number of committees out there just shows you how far we've come. So, that, yeah. so let me ask then broadly, um, what what initiatives have has the COA, the Canadian Orthopedic Association, undertaken? And I guess when you get to the point of trying to make to, trying to affect change you're probably trying to get a sense of the scope of the issue and we can call it a problem, um, you know, for lack of a better term at this point, but there's definitely an imbalance. Can you speak a little bit to the current stats around the imbalance regarding gender diversity within the field of surgery? And, and obviously you speak to orthopedics, but maybe even broadly if you have that data. Yeah, so you're exactly right. Finding out the information is actually was, was quite an interesting task, you know, with all the information, you know, not allowed to collect information and, and uh, health information um, acts and things like that. It's really hard to actually get data. And you can get data on gender, but you can't get data on if they're married or divorced or have children or, or are single parents. And so some of that deeper data is really hard to get. What we know is that in medicine, if you look at medical schools in Canada, actually over 50% of medical students now are women. If you look at the surgical subspecialties, I don't have the number at my yeah. fingertips, but much less. Yeah. Much, much less. And then if you look at the surgical subspecialties, orthopedics is really quite low on that, like right hmm. near the bottom. Okay. So I found that really disheartening because I just, I live my life and I'm a girl. So there's always a girl or in orthopedics around me. And, uh, but orthopedics very low. So we did do some stats, at least within the COA in orthopedics in Canada. And actually it's around 12% of orthopedic surgeons in Canada currently are women. And that's including, that's members of the COA because we don't have all the data outside of the COA membership. And I think another uh, point would also uh, be, would be important to consider is how many of those 12% of women in orthopedics are also in leadership positions? Are they reflected in places where they can affect and model change and also quite frankly, role model for other, um, you know, for a more diverse uh, specialty? Mm -hmm. So Canada actually mirrors the rest of the world in this, in that the higher up you go in leadership roles, the less women there are. So Kelly Lefebvre in Vancouver and her resident, I think Jen Hunter did a study on this in Canada. And it actually goes up, if you look at clinical professor, assistant, associate and professor, it goes down to like 1%. Okay. So it, it mirrors everywhere else in the world. So now, um, when you look at this information, um, what do you do with it? 
like so you know there's a there's an advocacy there's a awareness um and i think historically uh, i can't i can't imagine there hasn't been an awareness um among surgical subspecialties that we can certainly be doing more to have a more diverse and um, you know more diverse workspace but what are the fundamental barriers or challenges that you've uncovered that have to be sorted out yeah so i think you're exactly right in order to cha make change you have to understand what those barriers are and the problem is, is most of these barriers are deep rooted in our culture and deep rooted in medicine right from hundreds of years ago. So it's not like you can make a new rule and boom, it's going to change and there'll be 50% women in orthopedics. They're all really deep rooted in that. And, and a lot of that has to do with what they call the hidden curriculum. So you know I, I bet you could ask any woman in in medicine that you know when they when they ask their mentors what, what they what they do well well you don't want to do surgery it's hard to have a family if you have surgery you should really do family medicine then you can you know modify your career to you know to take care of your family so a lot of the the culture that women take care of the family and the men can work which i mean this is deep rooted for thousands of years mm. um is mixed right into our medical curriculum so and this is where i think mentorship becomes really important so again there's been lots of studies showing that it, if women in medicine have really good strong women mentors that i think can counteract that hidden curriculum that surrounds us through every part of our medical career that really helps so, you know, it, getting women more interested in doing some of these surgical subspecialties and then having strong mentorship for them and then ultimately changing the culture so that these things are not an issue. Right. I think one of the defenses always has been this as well. Listen, we'd love to be more diverse, but we just don't see women applying to our specialty. And therefore, by the time the women are at, at our level of being able to affect change, we're you know, we will try our best to create a diverse environment, but we just don't have women applying. How do you counter that? It sounds like you counter that by much earlier access, finding ways, and, and what can, I guess, surgery do to affect that? I guess it would be upstream, um, uh, or no, it's upstream or downstream, one way, further up, right? Like earlier on in their career, how do we, how do we advocate for that? Like, or is it just, you know, the classic, it's in someone else's court, let's hope they do their job so more women get interested in surgery. Well, I think it's pretty clear you have to address it early. So there's several programs in the US that have been very successful, uh, especially among the STEM students, like getting them interested in medicine, getting them interested in all the STEM specialties um, and getting them interested in surgery. At the COA, we've actually embraced that. For the last two COAs, we've had special sessions where in the location where the annual meeting was, we invited some residents and staff people to come and we did a, some talks and some open social hour where we could, and we invited uh, medical students, residents, and even some high school students to come in and talk to us and ask us what it's like to be an orthopedic resident, ask us what it's like to be an orthopedic staff person, ask me what it's like to have three kids in a year and a half while I was an orthopedic staff person. Because if you ask people, you'll get answers and you don't have to, you can, you can hear it from the people who have lived it. Right. So when you talk about champions, and this is something that you know, uh, when you look at a number of other areas of advocacy, they say, you know, it can't be done. Like women can't be the only ones advocating for women. It's, it's hugely important to see leaders, but how important is it to have men advocating also for the same diversity um, that, you know, that you'd be looking for and that you'd want your colleagues to look for. How do we, like, I guess, how do we affect that change and how important is it that we're united on this? I think I have the answer broadly, <laughs> but I'm sure you have a much more nuanced, yeah. nuanced I mean, approach. I, I think it's, it's absolutely vital. You cannot have a movement that, that gathers any steam or momentum if men aren't involved. And so this can't always be only women speaking to this. And there is a huge, uh, well, if you're on Twitter, the hashtag he for she. Oh. And I, I think it's, it's vital because the reality is, is men hold the power, whether they believe it or not. So men hold the power because they've been in charge of medicine and surgery for, for many, many years in Canada. And so women can't just stomp up and steal power from them. Power needs to be shared. And that, that really is, realization needs to come that, that we're all the same and we're all equal and we should all have the same opportunity. So unless men uh, really join the movement to, for equality uh, and try to change that culture, I don't. It's just going to go so slow. 
And I mean, you know, you've been involved in so many of these groups internationally. Um, these stories that you're that you're sharing are they pretty similar? Do they resonate with you? Like, is what's happening in Canada resonating with what's happening around the world? And can you share a little bit about any successes, like any any places where you think good strides are being made, and you know, we can get there? Yeah. So it's interesting if you contextualize Canada a little bit among the world. So IOTA's put out one paper in JTO. Uh, about worldwide and it's it's not comprehensive and that includes every country it included every country we had access to data and right now in that paper Canada ranks fifth in the percentage of women orthopedic surgeons um, which is actually really quite good I think we should be really really proud of that still it tells you that 12 percent is fifth that's so right. the highest country is actually Estonia and okay. Estonia has some very progressive ways of encouraging women in medicine and in orthopedics, they were just over 26% women orthopedic surgeons in Estonia. And so a country, looking at countries like that and how they've managed to change the culture around their medical practices, I think will be really interesting for, uh, for other countries to learn from. Do you, do you, oh, well, that's actually extremely, um, it, it, it's good to hear, but it sounds like, um, you know, that there's work to be done. When you look at true, um, well, I'll use the word equality, and, and maybe we can speak a little bit to some of these terms because they're used a lot. But when you look at where we need to go, what is, is there a cutoff or is it just always progress? You know, wherever we go is still progress, but is there a cutoff? Is it 50 50? Is it, you know, yeah. I mean, the, the purists would say it should be equal in terms of every aspect of, uh, you know, of, of a program. Is that the goal or is there more to it than that? It's a really great question, Mo, because like I would argue that, you know, orthopedics is a fairly um, hands on specialty and, it, and, and men or women are different, right? We're not equal. We're different. We yeah. complement each other, yeah. but we have, uh, but the key is equ equity of opportunity. So yeah, we don't yeah. really want equality. We want equity of opportunity. Okay. So if you have true equity of opportunity in Canada that women uh, can get into orthopedics should they desire so, and of course, um, bring in your merit in there also, like women that are qualified. Sure. But if there's true equity of opportunity, then we would actually know what that number is. And I, I think we're fooling ourselves if we, if we think it's 50-50, because I actually don't know. Maybe, right. it, maybe it's 70, 30, that there should be more women in orthopedics. Maybe, maybe it's 30, 70, you know, it, same with like obstetrics and gynecology. I might argue that that would end up having more women in it, perhaps. Like, right. I, I don't think we need it 50, 50, but equity of opportunity would, would allow us to find that out. And so that gets to a term and, uh, you know, I suspect you've heard this term and I'm still struggling with this term and trying to understand it. It's more not that I'm struggling with the concept. I think it's important, which is the issue of diversity versus inclusion. And uh, it's so one thing would be to say we have a percentage of, of men and women who are uh, in our faculty. Mm -hmm. Just being part of a faculty, does that, um, what are the experiences, I guess, of women in orthopedics? And it gets to the point of, do you feel heard? Do you feel included? I think seems to be the, the progress we're making beyond diversity. I totally understand just from a pragmatic point of view that you have to first find ways to get diversity um, and then bring in inclusion. But I see they seem to be very tied. And I suspect, um, you know, um, in the work you're doing, inclusiveness becomes another one of the you know, um, milestones that I think is really important for education advocacy. I don't know if you could speak a little bit to that concept. Well, I think, you know, inclusion comes when you truly embrace your diversity. So th this becomes the danger, right? Oh, you know, we better have three women on the COA executive because that will look good. Right, well, right, the you know, optics. If the, three, if the three women aren't listened to or heard or their ideas aren't heard, then you actually don't have diversity. Okay. Because diversity, you know, it means all ideas are heard. Well, the reality is, is if you have all the same people on a board or on a committee, they all come with one point of view. They, you never hear the other point of view. And so unless you, if you start hearing the other point of view, and then you actually start listening to the other point of view, then you start to get some inclusion. Yeah, and I think there's been work on that, uh, on that whole issue, right? Which is, if you just have a homogeneous group, they're unlikely to make um, 
decisions that would be superior to those in which you have gender diversity. And then you, if you add gender, you can add ethnic or geographic diversity. Then you can add, you know, a different ages, you know, bring in, bring in, you know, different levels of experience and so on and so forth. So I think there's data and supportive data in both in the business world. And I suspect that we'll see more of it entering into healthcare that it's probably, I mean, there's a real rational reason beyond the concept of, of optics, but I look at it kind of like, um, you know, diversity at the beginning seems optics, but inclusion is really the action point, right? So yes, we want to show that we're doing meaningful work, but ultimately the meaning comes in the fact that everyone feels their voices are heard and included. Mm -hmm. Can you speak, and I guess, you know, having done that, can you speak to what's left to be done? And I know there's a lot, so that's, I mean, <laughs> I think that go on for an hour or two hours. So, so maybe, maybe how, about, how about this? How about from your personal perspective, what are you up to these days? And when you look at the next 12 months of the work you're doing for advocacy, yeah. gender diversity. So uh, in, in, the, in the COA and the work I'm doing right now, I, I still feel like I'm really laying the foundation. So getting things like diversity statements out and making sure we have the information, making sure we have women speaker lists, making sure we have an appropriate number of women on the podium, like sort of those housekeeping things that, that actually are, have metrics that we can measure. Um, but the answer to your question is, I think ultimately we need to change culture. And, uh, you know, you can make all the rules you want and then you can have a good year because you have a president who is really into diversity and inclusion and sure. boom, uh, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you have women on podcasts. And, yes, yes, yes. But then you can have someone who, who's not like that your next year or, and, and then that all goes away. So I think we need to build it into our culture and we need to make it the norm. And like my ultimate dream was, is that what I've been doing with the COA is not needed anymore. And so all that inclusion, all the diversity is actually so part of our culture, our culture and orthopedics that, that it's second nature. But that only comes if it's part of our culture in Canada also. So it, you, can't, you can't have women have one role at the home and then have another role in the hospital. On that note, I cannot thank you enough for providing, you know, it's hard, to, it's hard to up that statement. I think that's an important, <laughs> poignant statement. It tells us we've come some ways, but we've got quite a bit to do. And I hope um, that those who spend a moment to, to listen to what you've said, uh, you know, really reflect on, on these words and become part of the uh, solution, right? And I think that's always the part, become part of the solution and not consistently the barrier to that solution. So, Laurie, thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to continuing to work with you in our roles, both at the COA, uh, but more importantly, you know, supporting the work you're doing and getting that message out to uh, as many people as we can. So thank you so much.